Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Legendarium Podcast. This is the Silmarillion, episode 11 of 11. Okay, I hope you've all had a nice journey getting here. I know it's been an uneven one. I'm sorry that we took such a long break for a little while there, but uh, but here we are. Episode 11 of 11. Today, we're talking about of the Rings of Power and the Third Age. This is the last entry in the Silmarillion. I am Craig Hanks, your host, and over them, well, his... Over them? Over them, is that what I said? Yes, over them. <laughs> Hello, them, whoever you are. Thank you for your kindness and... Being. Over there, <laughs> it's them, Ryan Bruckman. Hello, everyone. We're off to a great start. I, you know, I was going to insult you. I even had... Some, I was uh, going to say, like, his, his chip shot is as good as his reading comprehension, which is not saying much. There you are. Okay. Hi, hi Ryan. Hi. I insult yeah. you only because it's to make me feel better. Ryan and I just got done golfing, and uh, let's just say that he is more skilled at the game than I am, and I don't know. We'll leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. Might as well leave it there. Fair. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you on that one. Uh, so we are we are once again kyle Unfortunately, Kyle had to travel for work, and so he is uh, he's out this weekend. But here we are, uh, ready to talk the Silmarillion. Uh, so, Ryan... Do you, before we get into the content of this uh, chapter, for lack of a better word, this section of the book, mm-hmm. um, how do you feel now that you have read the Silmarillion cover to cover? Does it feel like, does it feel anticlimactic? Does it feel like a real accomplishment? Does it feel, I don't know, what, what, how, what are your thoughts? I'm never going to recover from this entirely, <laughs> this, this whole experience. It's just never going to happen. Uh, no, actually, I've, um, I'm, I'm, Glad to be at the end of it here. It's been a it's been a very enjoyable experience reading through it. Um, this last section is what like I don't know. I, I have a much better understanding of what the Silmarillion is and it isn't now. Mm. Um, even though we've read sections of it before, I feel like I could actually sit down with other people who have read the Silmarillion and be able to at least have a conversation. That's good to hear because uh, that's that's why I have you here. Well, yes. But other people who aren't you, I could sit down with other people who aren't you and have a conversation about the Silmarillion, at least enough to not get kicked out of the group or shunned immediately. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, well, yeah, that's true. I am all about the shunning. Um, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. It's uh, you. You have had some introduction to the Silmarillion before, as we've talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, reading bits and pieces here and there for the podcast. Um, but the way that you're reacting now reminds me very much of a lot of people's first time through where it's like oh yeah i kind of i i think i know yeah i got what mm-hmm. happened ish and i can kind of talk about it but it, you know i'm sure you would agree it would take yeah. another like three or four times through before you were like oh i have a really good handle on what's going on yes yes before i could get into this uh, you know go back and talk about you know the sailor who's uh uh not ellen deal yeah yeah see i'm i'm in i'm in that close there you go close range so close. where someone who knows more could grasp onto my <laughs> my thoughts and be like oh this is what you mean yeah you're yeah. so close you're so close yeah, yeah do you want to know what I, uh, I what i'm thinking about subtitling this episode if we have enough room in the title okay this is uh episode 11 of the rings of power and the, and third, the third age, age. or how i learned to stop worrying and love the rings of power uh the the new tv show the Amazon TV show. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Okay. So I I, I do kind of want to start there just because this is, uh, we're, we're recording this on, what is it, August 27th. Um, and so we're mere days away from the premiere of Amazon's mm-hmm. new series, The Rings of Power, uh, which is fortuitous. I'm glad we got this done, you know, by the time that came out. That's great. Um, but this is my last chance to say, you know, to kind of give my thoughts on the series before it has actually come out. Yeah. Um, and so I thought I would just kind of start in this section by saying I'm I'm glad that we got here and that I got to reread this section before the show came out because it kind of just reminded me of how, of what a good idea it is to just let go and just say, you know what, the show will be what it is um, mm-hmm. and it might be good, might be bad, whatever. But the reason I bring this up is because... Um, you know, you read all these just incandescently stupid think pieces uh, in whatever, you know, nerd site of the week mm-hmm. that's like, oh, the rings of power is betraying Tolkien's vision. Oh, how dare they do this or that or the other? And the show isn't even freaking out yet. They're just doing yeah. it for clicks, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And I, I hate it. I hate that so much. I, to be fair, I also hate the ones that, that go, oh, finally, an adaptation of Tolkien's vision that stays true to the author's uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, you're clearly... Uh, I, I, uh, what's a better word than filleting? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, <laughs> you're sucking up to, uh, to Amazon. Yeah, you know, it, it's clout chasing, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And so y- y- either side really kind of just infuriates me a little bit. Before anything comes out, like right. planting a flag that you can then work from afterwards, be like, <laughs> it's terrible. See how genius I was? I knew it was right. terrible. Or or you have to walk it back. Yeah. Be like, hey, well, they they beat all of expectations by proving, the, you know, by doing like this. <laughs> we all knew it was going to be bad. And who knew it was going to be great? Well, Anyone who didn't make a decision before it came out knew that it has a possibility. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. So the, so let me tell you why I bring this up. All right, I'm going to bring out my copy of the film. Really, and I'm going to go to um, close to the very end of this chapter. Uh, I, I checked, by the way. The Hobbit, as in the novel The Hobbit, mm-hmm. is one paragraph yes. in this chapter. And I also bracketed out uh, The Lord of the Rings, and that is four paragraphs. Uh, pretty close after that, obviously. So um, every high school kid who has who feels like they got to read this to report on it or anything like that, Samarillion <laughs> has your Cliff Notes version in there. If only that were true. Yeah. Uh, no, but I, I wanted to read. I, I wanted to read um, uh, three. Well, no, I'm sorry. It's one sentence, three clauses. Okay, that are separated by uh, by semicolons. And this is from our current chapter of the Rings of Power in the Third Age, okay? And I promise I'm bringing this back to the show. Uh, but the sentence goes like this. Uh, 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 Battle there was in Rohan, and Kurunir the traitor was thrown down, and Isengard broken. And Kurunir, oh no, sorry. And before the city of Gondor, a great field was fought, and the Lord of Morgul, Captain of Sauron, there passed into darkness. And the heir of Isildur led the host of the West to the Black Gates of Mordor. That is one sentence, Ryan. One sentence. And that covers Return of the King. And, and, and a healthy dose of the Two Towers. Two Towers, yeah. Right. Uh, all that to say, okay, so this is why I'm saying, you know, how I learned to stop worrying and love the Rings of Power. Okay, it's not out yet. Maybe I'll hate it. But the whole point being that you take one sentence like that and you can have something that you know, it, it, it's two and a half movies or, you know, one and a half movies or whatever you want to call it. Um, it but it could just as easily be four seasons of a TV show. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's why I, I'm i kind of excited about the show to see what they do, mm-hmm. to see what kind of story they come up with. OK, so they're they're not uh, drawing from this chapter per se. I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> whatever. Uh, of course they are. But they have rights to the appendices, the Lord of the Rings, and and it kind of sketches things out in a very similar way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, did you did you have any thoughts on this sort of thing as you were reading through this, and you're like, oh my gosh, I recognize that, and it's gone. Yeah, there was a handful of uh, little moments where because you had told me beforehand that you know the entirety of the Lord of the Rings is covered in like two pages or whatever, and so I was waiting for that, and I'm sitting right. here, and there's still stuff going up, and I'm like, oh, here's the. I can hear this in Kate Blanchett's voice almost that they're talking about these <laughs> events happening. You know, the the last uh, alliance of elves and men standing against Sauron and things like something. Okay, I'm recognizing that. But how much there still is in the areas around that was still nice. I'm mm-hmm. expecting because I was kind of like, okay, we finally caught up. So I shouldn't, I really shouldn't have to focus too much because this is going to be recognizable. This isn't going to tax me the same way that some of the other ones have. Um, that being said, there's still a lot of Sauron's rise to power in the first parts of this and his creation of the mm. the rings and his planning of uh, how he's going to kind of bring all the elves into subjugation to himself through the rings, them catching him. A lot of those things that happened earlier on, I was like, oh yeah, that's, there's still a lot of content here that's really enjoyable. And yeah, just things that you could do more with inside the Lord of the Rings itself. So Right. You know, I remember when we were reading uh, some of the earlier chapters in the Silmarillion uh, and and the question would come up, who is the main character? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and when we were in the Quinta Silmarillion, it, I, I don't know if I love this answer, but you could certainly make a case for Morgoth, right? It, right. It's about the, the rise and fall of Morgoth and um, his, his, his own quest for the Silmarils, so to speak. Mm-hmm. 
right? Uh, but if you blow it out side of the Quintus Silmarillion and say, who is the main character of this entire story? You could make the same kind of case for Sauron. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he would be a more interesting main character, uh, you know, after reading this section than Morgoth himself. I don't know. Thoughts, feelings? Um, depending on your starting point, yes. Uh, I think you could easily make Sar make Sauron a an inter a more interesting main character. Um, I think Morgoth has just so much in the beginning of the Silmarillion, right, on there that to try and minimize that to to make him more grand or to try and watch Morgoth's rise through the eyes of Sauron or something might be an interesting take on the beginning. You know, the, the, the way I think of it is, um, if you go back and watch the Lord of the Rings movies, the Peter Jackson 2001, whatever, um, uh, Sauron is to Morgoth in that what the Witch King is to Sauron in the Silmarillion. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, Morgoth, at, at some point, he just kind of fades into the background and he's like this scary thing that keeps <laughs> sending out hosts of orcs or whatever, and eventually yeah. he's vanquished. Um but Sauron is is the one who is kind of out in the field doing the dirty work. He's yeah. the one doing the shape shifting and capturing this and that elf lord and torturing this person and mm -hmm. uh, whatever. Anyway, so yeah, I kind of I kind of feel like they fill the same role in that way. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So Ryan, did you have anything uh, from this section that you wanted to pull out and and uh, any favorite moments or lines or, or anything like that as we get going? There was something that actually raised a question for me because i feel like we had discussed it before and i see if i can find it here um if it takes you time to find it we could always do a uh, what's that word a recap <laughs> <laughs> now nah, we'll worry about that later um let's well i've, I've got it here um it's sauron uh he talks about sending his great force against the new realm of gondor and he took me to Ithil and he destroyed the white tree of isildur that grew there but isildur Dur escaped and taking with him the seedling of a tree, I is that the tree that's? I, in, I feel like that's the one that's in Minas Tirith. Minas Tirith. Yes. Okay. Which is a descendant of. Yeah. So he the, like this is from the beginning of the <clears throat> Silmarillion to this point. I am following a tree. Yes. From the beginning of the book to this point. Correct. Okay. All the way through to the end of the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the whole book's about a tree. That's our that's, <laughs> that's main our main character. <laughs> the Absolutely. Tree. No. I hey, why the heck not? This is Tolkien, after all. The main character, yes, can be a tree. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, the eldest of trees, Telperion, mm -hmm. right? That so there were the two trees, Laurelin and Telperion. But Telperion was the one that lit up the first um, uh, of the two. So it was the eldest of the two trees of Valinor. Um, and then, yes, a descendant of that tree. And so it didn't shine with its own inner light, but it was still a tree in the likeness of Telperion that, that was flowering in, uh, in Numenor, mm -hmm. in Akalabeth, right? And so in that story, we even talked about in the last episode, yeah, there's this moment when Isildur goes and he, has, he rescues one fruit from the, the dying tree um, and plants that and, and keeps mm -hmm. the line going, right? Um, and he does it again here. And so it's uh, it's a very, very similar situation. This where is one thing he gets when the house is burning down. <laughs> he goes and he grabs the fruit from the tree or My, grabs yeah. part of the tree. That's right. Kids, family, whatever. I got to get to the tree. Oh, they're they're fine. Yeah, no, they've got uh, stewards and whatnot. Oh, they're fine. I got to get the tree. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so he gets the tree. And now to be uh, to be clear about what's going on, um, he's in Minas Ithil. Mm -hmm. which is, uh, we know it from the movies, you know, I'm just kind of going for people who, uh, you know, are, are more familiar with uh, kind of the regular movie stuff. This is Minas Morgul. Which is where the Witch King and his army came out of. Yes. Yeah. So in Return of the King, as uh, Frodo and Sam, uh, in the books, it's in the Two Towers, but in the, in the movies, it's in Return of the King. Um, they're about to climb the steps, but before they do, there's that city with the pillar of fire that shoots yeah. up into the sky. That's Minas Morgul used to be Isildur's city, Minas mm -hmm. Ithil, uh, so Tower of the Moon. I think it was what Tower of the Rising Moon uh, is what they call it. Um, and uh, Anarion, his brother, was in Minas Anor, uh, which, was, which became Minas Tirith. Tirith. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. So when Minas Ithil is sacked, uh, Isildur grabs a seedling from the tree, brings it to Minas Anor, and plants it there in the courtyard, and you know there it flowers. So yeah, that's that's the tree we're following. That is so Minas Morgul, and Minas Morgul is next to Ang Angbad, Angbad, whatever, right? 
No, no, you're th- uh, Angbad is uh, the is Morgoth's realm in the north uh, back in the first age. Okay, uh, you're thinking of Kirith Ungol, oh, uh, the Pass of the Spider. Pass of the spider there. Yep. I just remember like because it. I think there was something about that. Minas Ethel was the like the first defense against the darkness or something like that. Right. right. So yeah, because the idea is Minas Ethel uh, is on the shoulders of the mountains of shadow. Mm-hmm. So these are the, the Ethel Duoth is uh, the mountain range that borders the western side of Mordor um, and the eastern side of of uh, Gondor. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, that's where Minas Ethel is. It was built there because there was a pass in that location and hey we, you know we can't let evil out of here so we're gonna build this you know grand city to make sure that uh yeah that that pass is impassable for evil mm-hmm. um so yeah that's that's why that's there but eventually uh, yeah the witch king and his ilk overthrow the city and turn it into the the cursed you know, minas morgul yeah. so the, okay yeah anyway um you know i feel like there was some other oh Speaking of uh, speaking the Lord of the Rings connections, because this is uh, it's a chapter where you can start to not I shouldn't say start to you can make connections with a lot of the Lord of the Rings stuff, and we have throughout this yeah. reading. But this is where it obviously really kicks into high gear. Uh, but you know what I was reminded of, Ryan? I was reminded of you and me about the age of uh, what seventeen, eighteen. You know our best years. Oh, right. absolutely! Oh, we peaked for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh no uh 17 18 years old something like that sitting in my basement playing lord of the rings risk yes <laughs> all right so this is uh just as a sidebar uh one of the legendarium tangents right mm-hmm. uh lord of the rings risk definitely one of the best editions of risk and not just because it's Lord of the Rings themed, because it's legit, really well done. Yeah. Uh, so really great game. The reason I bring it up is um, because right at the beginning of the chapter, okay, now we're finally getting back to the beginning of things. Um, at the beginning of the chapter, it kind of gives us an overview of what was going on in Middle Earth during the Second Age. Um, and so we previously talked about in the Kalabeth, we talked about uh, what was going on in Numenor, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, what was going on in the second age there. And they would have stopovers in Middle Earth. Hey, we're coming as, uh, as teachers and gods, basically. Oh, no, yeah. no, never mind. We're slavers and horrible, terrible people. Um, but that was all from the Numenorean's perspective. And for a few pages, we get um, kind of what was going on on the other side of the sea mm-hmm. in the second age, right? Anyway, um, and there are little bits in here, um, like, let's see, others of the Eldar there were who crossed the mountains of Ered Luin in that age and passed into the Inner Lands. Uh, kind of talking about Middle Earth there. Many of these were Teleri, survivors of Doriath and Osiriand, which are names that you probably, like... They're, they're you, sparking. Yeah, exactly. They're sparking. You, you recognize that those are names from the Quintus Silmarillion, but it's going to take a while before you... If the video was on me, there'd be a very confused, semi-constipated look on my face as I'm trying to remember <laughs> what, where those can is, come it, from. It is now, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they established realms among the Sylvan Elves in woods and mountains far from the sea, for which, nonetheless, they yearned in their hearts. Okay, now we get into it. Only in Eregion, which men call Holland, did elves of Noldorian race establish a lasting realm beyond the Ered Luin. Eregion was nigh to the great mount, mount, uh, sorry, mansions of the dwarves that were named Khazad-dûm, but by the elves Hadharthrond. <laughs> I can't even say it. <laughs> and afterwards Moria. Uh, no, my point with this is, if anybody wants to have a really good time, uh, get Lord of the Rings Risk and play that uh, right after having read this chapter, um, and and preferably also the appendices to the Lord of the Rings, because uh, it's got a lot of the place names that they threw into that game, and it it gives the game even more like depth and fun and history. Where it's it's kind of like a bunch of history mashed together because they kind of have like third age fortresses along with second age fortresses, and I don't mm-hmm. know. It's uh, it, it's kind of fun. Um, but you get to recognize a lot more than of the names and it will, believe it or not, help you learn the geography of where these places are. Mm-hmm. You know, where, what, what do you mean Arid Lewin? What is that? You will learn if you play Lord of the Rings Risk and you know, what, what is this fortress? You will learn if you play the game. So I feel like we're right on the edge of like, 
We talked good about the Amazon show. We're telling people to go buy Lord of the Rings Risk and you'd find it out on Amazon. Oh, that's right. right. We're just right there. People are going to start calling us Amazon shills. You know? Well, I, I, it's not Amazon. I, I don't think they have anything to do with like, the, well, that was Hasbro that made. Well, yeah, I'm just saying. Risk, right? Where would you go to try and find it and buy it? <laughs> There's going to be an affiliate link on our website. Yeah, for there Lord you of the go, Rings exactly, Risk where exactly. you can buy it. and Buy yours today. <laughs> Uh, no, we're, we're not sponsored by anybody. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean we couldn't be. Okay. <laughs> I have a very, very cheap soul. Um, and so when I say that it's for sale to the highest bidder, that is not difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. What else you got? What, what else do you want to talk about uh, um, from your notes? Uh, so there is something I feel like that... <sighs> I, I I I tread into semi dangerous territory here, um, but the time Sauron is the necromancer. Mm, yes. Um, so give us some background here. Tell us what's going on if you know. Uh, I can do it if you want. As you'll probably give better there, but Sauron takes up his. He's kind of disappeared for a bit. Well, but why? He's disappeared because the ring was cut from, cut his, from his hand. Yeah, this is after. Yeah, this is after the, he's lost the ring. It's in a river and it stays there for two and a half thousand years, I believe, before it's found. <laughs> you remember, yes, you remember the prologue from the movie. Yes, yes. good. Um, so his <laughs> his spirit, he takes up residence in Dol, Gold, Dol Gold, Goldur um, and starts to try and come back and gather the powers with, to him again um, as the necromancer there. And we get a taste of this in the Hobbit films, but not in the Hobbit book. Yes. Or anything like that. So it's really, this is, this is one of those things where there's an element here that I recognized. Yeah. But it wasn't, be, it, like, it was just from that, from the Hobbit films. There's like, oh, I know this part of the story that this exists, and I don't know how to reconcile it with what I saw there, with what I know here. It's right. Like, yeah. It was just, it, it caught my attention to be like, this is an, this is another anchor point that I grabbed onto. I'm like, oh yeah, I know this part. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The necromancer, uh, the, what I think they call him the sorcerer. I don't think the word necromancer appears in here. Uh, the necromancer is a name that we get from the later editions of the Hobbit. Uh, Okay. or it might be in the, er in the earliest editions, but he didn't know who the, the necromancer was when he wrote it. It was Mm -hmm. just some kind of like nameless fear in the South part of the woods. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, now we do know what's going on. Where was I going with this? Something about the necro... Oh, yeah, the, the movies. Um, please please disregard all Hobbit movies when it comes to this material. <laughs> I, um, I Just really quickly, I'll, I'll tell you. If you ask me now, yes, there is a half of a good Hobbit movie. Basically, the first half of the first movie is uh, an acceptable... Um, you know, translation onto screen of, of The Hobbit. And then the rest of it is just like, yikes. Not entirely, but in large measure. Um, anyway, but yeah, that scene, it, what bothers me about that, and, and it just actually kind of ties into the Amazon, Amazon show, but what bothers me about that is that um, we've got Gandalf and Galadriel, Elrond, Círdan, uh, whoever else, Gilgalad, uh, oh no, Gilgalad's dead now. <laughs> but they form the White Council. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, these are the, the greatest minds and leaders of, uh, of the elven kingdoms basically. And the, and the wizards. Cause, uh, yeah, we now have wizards. Like, right. This, right. Be- they've now become a thing in which, yeah, we should also talk about it at some point, but, um, but okay. Now we have the white council and they're going to deal with this problem. Where is the ring? We need, we, should we try to find the ring? Oh, who's this? In, who's the necromancer what's going on in these uh in, in greenwood or murkwood as it's now called um and there's a bit where it says okay we need to chase this evil out so they do and in silmarillion fashion this takes all of one or two sentences mm-hmm. so they decide on it and they they raid the fortress of dol Guldur and chase out the evil there. And, you know, and of course in the story, like, oh, they saw him, there's Sauron saw him coming. So he had already kind of made his move and flees down to Barad-dur and rebuilds mm-hmm. his tower there. Right. But anyway, um, the reason why this kind of makes me roll my eyes is because in the movie, in the Hobbit, they pull some of this uh, info in and then they, 
they make it all about those heroes. So literally, the White Council goes and the the four or five of them are are you know wizard battling, kind of you know like mm-hmm. uh, like Saruman and and uh, Gandalf do in in the Fellowship of the Ring. They're wizard battling. Oh, you know we're gonna blast out all this evil or whatever. Where in reality, as you're reading this, it's pretty clear that it's not just like, oh, some wispy bit of Sauron is living here and we better chase it out. It's no, he's gathering power, he's gathering forces. Mm-hmm. There are orcs and trolls and fell beasts and whatnot. He's gathering his forces to Dol Guldur and that's what they need to chase out. And so the idea that it wouldn't have been an actual battle is kind of ridiculous um, and also weird that Peter Jackson would have skipped a chance to have an, a, a battle because mm-hmm. <laughs> we know how he loves his battles, right? Um, and so anyway, I don't know. It's just, a, I, this is one of those subjective, like people can read it differently if they want to, but it's always bothered me that it was, hey, we need to give our heroes more screen time. And so they're going to go chase out uh, nothing mm-hmm. versus you know, hey, let's let's uh, actually do some work to gather an alliance of all these uh, different forces and, and go actually raid the place mm-hmm. with, a you know, a whole army. I don't know. I can see that. I can understand the, when you're, especially if your vi- visual of it is a whole battle, large thing, and then I can see that being disappointing. Yeah, yeah, it was disappointing. Um, and again, it's... Uh, Head cannon, you know, whatever you want to call it. I get that it, it, this is not something I'm, it's not a hill I'm going to die on. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to take anybody to task if they read it differently than me, but uh, it's just kind of. But so help you, Peter Jackson will. He will die on that hill. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to make a Peter Jackson joke, but you know what? That would have been uncouth of me. Uh, okay. So, Ryan, let me give you this one. I want to I get your take on this. Um, this is the section where we are introduced to the Ulairi, the ring raids. Mm-hmm. Um, they could walk, if they would, unseen by all eyes in this world beneath the sun, and they could see things in worlds invisible to mortal men. All right. Now, my question is this, Ryan. Is the Lord of the Rings fantasy or is it science fiction? the reason i ask is because um you know we're gonna get to we'll we'll get to this uh, at the end of the chapter but we kind of touched on this at the end of akala beth where the world is remade reshaped by iru and uh essentially the world was flat before and Mm -hmm. he makes the world round but there is still a straight path Okay, and there's, it's right. actually, I'm sorry, I'm, I actually am going to read that because I, I just love the language of this. This is the last bit of, uh, of the, the entire book um, in the, uh, talking about the, the final ship that Círdan and the rest, you know, Frodo and, and they sail Gandalf, off. and yeah, mm-hmm. they're sailing off. In the twilight of autumn, it sailed out of Mithlond until the seas of the bent world fell away beneath it, and the winds of the round sky troubled it no more, and borne upon the high airs above the mists of the world, it passed into the ancient west. Okay, and I love this idea, this this image, I, I should say, of um, it, it sailed out of Mithland until the seas of the bent world fell away beneath it. And it's so it gets gets into this idea that I have that um, when. Uh, the the the, uh, the powers the gods um, you know that are in the blessed realm they are tied to this world but hang on a second now they're not on this world you know how how is this all working because they're they're supposed to be tied to the confines of of Arda and in this case it, it makes me think okay so he basically separated uh, dimensions mm-hmm. right and he he created this other uh, Eru created this other dimension for uh, for the, for the gods and for the elves to live in. Um, as, so as the boats are sailing into the West, you know, they keep sailing straight on this flat piece of ocean and the world curves and eventually they see it kind of falling away underneath them, but they're still sailing straight. I, mm-hmm. It's a lovely, lovely image. I really like it. But then we add to that. Now we have what we, you know, again, if you're familiar with the movies, you've seen, you know, Frodo when he puts the ring on and, yeah. Uh, you know, suddenly the ring rays look like kings and all that stuff. 
Um, so you have, what's the line? World's invisible to mortal men. Mm -hmm. And I just love this idea that he, without saying so, basically said, yeah, we're doing different dimensions. They just live on a different plane of existence. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do you make of all this? Uh, it, to answer your question, is it fantasy or science fiction? <laughs> to use... Yeah. Okay, am I being flippant? Fine. Well, to use the Lord of the Rings to answer that question a little bit, if we were to understand and draw out the hard magic of this is the dimension, you know, different dimensions, those things like that, this would be more science fiction. Mm. We don't have the hard lines. We don't have those things. So but because we lack that understanding, it falls closer to fantasy, mm. in my opinion, on that setup. If Tolkien had come out, like all of a sudden we found this magic book, <laughs> it pops out of a drawer like, oh, we found out here's this hard magic system that he actually had it all laid out. Here's how the dimensions worked. We understood that. We'd go, oh yeah, this is actually, this is more science fiction because we have the greater understanding of the process behind some of those things. So it's not to say that every hard magic system turns something into science fiction, but it brings it closer to that line by giving you rules and things that feel more scientific yeah. than the fantasy of just saying, <laughs> Shazam, it's, it is this way. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I am being flippant with the question, you know, is this fantasy or science fiction? But it is kind of fun to to look with our 21st century, century goggles on this mm -hmm. story that he wrote in the mid 20th century and say like, Oh, isn't that kind of fun? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it feels like it almost could be science fiction. -y. And I, to be, uh, to be clear, this is actually something I love to do with all sorts of stuff. You can do this with religion a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you come up with some kind of sci-fi reason. Right? Oh, like, I have a whole spiel about God is an alien <laughs> that I, I've thrown to some family and friends and the looks I get afterwards and the Christmas cards stop coming. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got, uh, there was, Sarah and I were, um, we went to dinner. This is when we lived in Seattle. So this is a, a solid 10 years ago. Um, we went to dinner with this family that we went to church with. And they, uh, we sat down, we're eating like salmon or steak or whatever they were grilling that day. And we put it on the table and we're having this nice meal. And then they sprung it on us. <laughs> it was this whole spiel that this guy had about how Jesus was a clone, uh, like legit, 100%, uh -huh. like, oh no, yeah, no, they, they have cloning technology, and so when it says that Jesus and God are the same, it's a, it's actually, he's a clone, and they, you know, so they're separate, but they're the same, and, blah, blah, and he went on for a while. That changes my feelings towards Django Fett. <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, it was a highly interesting dinner and a lot of fun, so, <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, let's see. Ryan, wizards. Wizards. We wiz said we wanted to talk about the wizards. Go ahead. Um, again, the recognizable point, but for having read so many thousands of years, hundreds of years of story and history in this, we've been dealing with gods and demigods and stuff like this, the Maya, right. Maya, like this. Now we have the wizard crew. Sure. Who are Maya themselves. Right. Um, but it's they've taken on a different form now. And my question, I guess, is why now are they wizards <laughs> when they weren't before? What is the necessity of taking this form? Why do we now have Gandalf and Radagast and the two that go off to the east? And, right. Like, why not just stay Mighty Maiar? Like, like I know they still are technically. But right. I don't know. It, why Why now? Why this? Why, why wizard? Why wizard now? <laughs> this is good sentence structures. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the professional. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you, please check for signs of a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the, the short answer is, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I, it, it's okay. We were kind of poking fun at uh, people who had... Uh, funny religious explanations for things right but uh but we could also play the same game here okay so why would uh <laughs> why would they be sent the yeah, why would the Ainur or no sorry not the Ainur whatever why would they send the Maiar um over as wizards and why not you know clothed in their full glory or whatever mm -hmm. right and ultimately I guess the best I could come up with is that um that they aren't it, 
through the entire Silmarillion, they don't generally directly interfere, except in moments of great need, mm-hmm. right? Um, and now they there's um, okay, so there's a, a great danger with the the ring and you know the, the troubles going on in Middle Earth, and so they're going to send some emissaries over but it's not like hey we're gonna clean up all of your messes right it's um you know hey here are here's a resource to hopefully help the people of middle earth and whatever and what's interesting to me about all of this so uh, sorry to answer your question like why why don't they just send them over i guess that's the best i can come up with because they don't want to just strip the people of middle earth of all of their responsibility Uh, yeah does that Yes. Is that fair? And I can, I can understand that, but there's also the whole element, like we talked about the White Council earlier, that is, they lead that white, they lead that, that is what they are, you know, the White Council plus others there. So I I don't know. It was just something that I, I couldn't quite figure out other than, cool, we now have new names and a new kind of focus and form for them, you know. Right. Well, it kind of gets to, so we've talked a lot about how, you know, Tolkien is a, a strident Catholic and this is a very Catholic work. Um, and it kind of gets into the idea of guardian angels or mm-hmm. something along those lines. I don't know what you know, my my Catholic theology is shaky, right? <laughs> but uh, let's take guardian angels for a moment because uh, Tolkien has said Gandalf is an angel. If he represents anything in this story, it's an angel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if God is going to send an angel down, it's not going to be like, um, you know, oh, okay, here's Saint, you know, Michael here to wield his flaming sword and just cut down all of your enemies and make everything perfect for you forevermore. It's not quite the way he operates. So if we're going from that Catholic point of view, he's going to send somebody down to nudge people to help guide them in the right direction, but not necessarily fix all their problems. Right? True. Yeah, I mean... Yes, there's some. We're gonna get into theological Let's do discrepancies do it, do it, in there. Do it, do it. I mean, just <laughs> there's stories in the Bible of where, but it's it's a way of God showing His power that it's like, no, look, uh, you know, the Old Testament, the um, uh, the horn blowing of Jericho, right? Things like yeah, that, yeah. where it's you know, it's still people having <laughs> to do the horn it. blowing of Jericho, <laughs> the new children's <laughs> book by Ryan James <laughs> Bruckman. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of worse things that could be titled that. that um, ain't that the truth? <laughs> <laughs> Who's Jericho? Uh, <laughs> anyway, Joshua. Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, this episode is something else. I don't know what's uh, happening here. Yeah, it took me a minute to find the song. Um, anyway, but just saying, like, theologically speaking, though, there are times when God will have a host of angels do the work so long as the faith is shown by the right. mortals beforehand I'll help, yeah god helps those who help themselves and all that stuff right yeah. along those lines so with the that that idea as to why they are that way makes some sense but there is also a carpet that can be pulled out from underneath that sure that logic so uh, let me let me pull out another one another rug out from underneath this so-called logic awesome um just that uh you know where the analogy falls apart like these are not angels you know he in the story of the lord of the rings yeah there are times when gandalf definitely represents an angel and that's totally fine but what's interesting is how much agency the wizards have Mm -hmm. themselves and how like how differing their decision making is obviously we have gandalf versus sauron and sauron gets too deep into the the lore of the enemy and begins to see him he envies him as a rival instead of seeing him as an enemy right Mm -hmm. Or, you know, whatever the the language is in this section. Uh, But not just that. We also have Radagast, who kind of, uh, he just isn't, um, he isn't as diligent in his mission. He kind of gets wrapped up in uh, loving the the living things of Mm Middle-earth, right? Um, And so, we you know, we learn more about him elsewhere, but we kind of touch on that a little bit. He was all about the birds and the beasts and the forests and all that stuff. Um, And so Radagast kind of, yeah, it's not like he's a bad dude. He's not Saruman, but he kind of he isn't very stalwart in his mission mm-hmm. the way that uh, the way that Mithrandir is. Um, and then we have the two blue wizards who show up, go into the west or sorry, go into the east and mm-hmm. are never heard from again. It's like, yeah, thanks a pantload, Chet. <laughs> Appreciate that. 
thanks for all your help. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we start with five, and immediately we're down to three. They land on the shores, and immediately, nope. <laughs> Bye. Bye. So, um, anyway, uh, that's that's something I don't know what to do with it. I'm not bringing it up because I have something deep or profound to say about it. But isn't it mm-hmm. interesting that uh, that these um, angels, for lack of a better word, are sent over to Middle Earth and they get to decide how much of their mission they fulfill, right? Yeah. I mean, ultimately, it still falls under the very first chapter set up where Iru says, you can do nothing that will not help my plan. Right. Like, so go and, you know, your battles, everything that happens, no matter what, like, ultimately, whatever happens with Sauron and you, it's part of what I've got planned out. I've got, to borrow a term from another wonderful series, an ineffable plan, you will. <laughs> I will. Yeah. I will, absolutely. Um, all right, anything else on that, or do you want some words of the day? No, let's go to words of the day. I'm, I'm done sounding like I've had a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> right, now it's my turn, right? All right, here's one for you. Uh, let's see. The ancient kingdom kingdom of Mordor beyond the Ethel Duoth, the mountains of shadow, and that country marched with Gondor upon the east. Whoa, whoa, whoa! They marched with Mordor marched with Gondor on the east. No, march is another word for border. Um, so it's a, it's an old word for border, uh, and that that's it. Okay, so there's one of your words of the day. Wait, you look confused. I that why would you use that word to mean border then if it's also a move for (laughs) that just is asking for confusion well you know what it's also asking for a little bit more from the reader and if you just give it a little bit and these days all you have to do is google it yeah but how am I supposed to know the word march is not a hard word for like (laughs) I know that word you throw like Ethel Duat at me and I'm like sure (laughs) That's a great 50s actress or something, I'm sure. But March, I know. I'm not going to go look it up because I know that. (laughs) How am I supposed to know to look up that that means something different? (laughs) All right. Here's one that you should know to look up. Weregild. W-E-R-E. Okay, like, you know, like werewolf or werebear Mm -hmm. from The Hobbit, right? Weregild. G-I-L-D. So let's see. Give you some context. Isildur. Oh, so Isildur has cut the ring from Sauron's hand. Um, and uh, Elrond and Círdan stood by. They cancel- counseled him to cast it into the fire. Isildur refused this counsel, saying, "This I will have as Weregild for my father's death and my brother's." Okay, so I'll just tell you, uh, Weregild. So where, uh, you know, kind of like werewolf. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a man wolf. Okay, so where is an old English word for man, and guild is a price. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a man price. And what's interesting is uh, you, you go back in history and uh, you, you go into Anglo-Saxon England and the law was that according to your station, you know, whatever your level in the caste system of the day was, you had a price. You were worth X amount. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and so if, uh, oh, actually there's a great scene. If you go and watch uh, The Last Kingdom, uh, fantastic show. Everybody should go watch it. It's really good. It's on Netflix. Um, but if you go watch The Last Kingdom, the the hero has, it, it, this is in uh, that kind of Anglo-Saxon England, he has this little town that he's the lord of, and one day he catches somebody, one of his own uh, peasants, for lack of a better word, stealing from him. Uh, he comes back from the war and finds out this guy has been uh, kind of skimming off the top, and he just runs him down, just slaughters the dude in the street. Uh, and so he murders the guy, but that isn't actually against the law necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, but what he has to do is pay a wear guild to that guy's family. So the price for that man's life, he is supposed to pay that to them. Okay, so that's a wear guild. And so when, which which uh, I, I think is is actually uh, kind of interesting because when uh, Isildur takes the ring and he says this I will have as wear guild for my father and my brother's deaths mm-hmm. um, he's saying this is the most powerful artifact since the Silmarils in Middle Earth and my father and brother were so valuable not just to me but to mankind and Middle Earth generally that uh, that the only price for their death could be this ring 
right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, so uh, is that too long of an explanation for the word wear guild? Maybe, <laughs> but just the point being, there's a reason why he would use that word and yeah. why why he takes the ring. The extra explanation is uh, appreciated rather than just leaving it. It means man price. So <laughs> man price. I do love that. Uh, last one is not so meaningful, but I thought it was kind of fun. Um, and the word is slot, S L O T. Okay, slot. Uh, let's see. This is when Isildur, uh, he's taking the ring, he's going up north. Um, and let's see, nearby the Gladden Fields, a host of orcs overtake his camp and just slaughter everybody, right? Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. He puts on the ring and hides. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. Isildur himself escaped by means of the ring. For when he wore it, he was invisible to all eyes. But the orcs hunted him by scent and slot until he came to the river and plunged in. So scent, uh, So they hunted him by scent and slot. Scent, that's, yeah, okay, his smell, fine. But slot, what does that mean? Slot is an old Norse word for the um, the hoof prints of deer. Okay. And other animals like that. Si- like, the footprint. That's I was gonna guess footprint. Yeah, but. no, that's yeah, really good guess. I I wasn't sure. I had to look it up mm. uh, to be sure. Um, so the slot was yeah, it's an old Norse word for that. Now what's uh, interesting for giant hardcore nerds like me. So if you go on our YouTube channel, I've got uh, our series on what makes prose good, and I spent the whole first video talking about um, you know old English words or Germanic versus Latinate words and whatever. Um, this is a weird one and I'm highlighting this as, so if you, if you haven't watched those videos, please go check them out. I, I hope they're interesting. If any, if this even kind of interests you, then, uh, yeah, please go check those videos out. Um, but in this case, it's an old Norse word that came into English after it passed through old French. So the, the, the old French picked it up and it became, uh, let's see. It, so it goes from slot to, uh, esclot. And then finally comes back to English. Um, and so they apparently didn't get it from the Norse. They, they, they got it from old French, but like hundreds of years later. Hmm. Um, and yeah, just means uh, hoof prints, basically. Deer, deer prints. So anyway, there you go, Ryan. There's your education for the day. How do you feel? Smarter? Yes. <laughs> uh, all right, so... I do have a complaint. Do you have anything else that you want to bring up? Because I feel like I've been grandstanding for a few minutes here. <laughs> no, no. Let's go to your complaint. You can... sure? Yeah. All right. So, <sighs> I love Tolkien's works. What? <laughs> Get out of here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love all this stuff. You know that. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean there aren't things that kind of... Uh, that bug me. Mm-hmm. That legit bug me, and it's not like a little. Oh, you know, I wish I wish he wouldn't use this grammatical, you know, turn of phrase. Like, no, this this is a, a real thing that bugs me in Tolkien. And part of it is part of what bugs me is that it's kind of inconsistent. Mm-hmm. Um, where most of the time he actually seems to be pretty good on the subject, but when he kind of lets his um his <laughs> Anglo-Saxon epic mode uh, when he lets that take the reins then this sort of thing comes out uh, let's see so now we're, we're kind of in the twilight phase of, um, of the Numenorians in Middle Earth whatever yet at the last in the wearing of the swift years of Middle Earth Gondor waned and the line of Meneldil son of Anarion failed For the blood of the Numenorians became much mingled with that of other men, and their power and wisdom was diminished, and their lifespan was shortened, and the watch upon Mordor slumbered. But that first part, okay. So the blood of the Numenorians became much mingled with that of other men, and their power and wisdom was diminished. Uh, This drives me crazy. I really don't Mm -hmm. like it. If you want to tell me... Now, uh, okay. So, I'm sorry. Before I really get into this, let's, let's... (laughs) <laughs> set our table here um the power and wisdom <sighs> okay we can we can argue about what those words actually mean and you know wise isn't necessarily it 
much like the word slot uh yeah. or much like what was the other one um not where guild what was what was the first one we brought up um uh, marched. marched yeah yeah much like those words he may have had something else in mind but as i read it uh, i don't know it sounds kind of iffy where it's it's kind of like this weird race essentialism where it's mm-hmm. like well right yeah <laughs> you're but your blood mingled with that of lesser men. Mm-hmm. Ugh. If you want to tell me that, uh, you know, they, they intermarried a bunch, their blood was mingled with that of, uh, you know, the other people of Middle Earth, and so they got shorter, fine. Mm-hmm. No problem. I've got, yeah, okay, fine. They, they were very tall, and now they're not quite as tall as they once were. Fine. But the, the idea of like, oh, but, oh, and thus passed their power and wisdom feels icky to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that fair? Yeah, I understand the the sentiment there and it feeling feeling off, especially nowadays where it's something that we're that that seems like something that's more common in our discussions nowadays is identifying racism and identifying uh, right. things like that. It's it's something that we're a lot more conscious of now <laughs> than we have been in the past. Right. Um so I can definitely see that whether that's what he's going for or not. I I highly I shouldn't say I highly doubt, but I would. I I really don't think he just had this moment where he's like, you know, I've done this fantastic epic work. Let me just slide this little racist line in here. <laughs> just, just get that a little bit out there. I'm just on a really bad day, and I just oh, and the new no, I, and yeah, I don't think that's how that was. I but. really, yeah, I really, really doubt that. It's more just that uh, it's a it's a good reminder that uh, Tolkien was a man of his time. Mm-hmm. Um, now, for somebody of his time, I think he actually did pretty darn well. Yeah. Um, I, I really do. There's, <laughs> we've talked before about that, that great line when, uh, the Nazis wanted to publish the Hobbit in Germany, mm-hmm. but they, so they sent, uh, they sent Tolkien a letter asking for his, basically his family tree. They want to make sure that there wasn't any Jewish blood in him before he <laughs> published the, before they published his book in Germany. Mm-hmm. And he sent them back this uh, amazing note that was, it said something I'm paraphrasing here, but it was like, no, sadly, I, uh, uh, I, I don't have any of that uh, the the blood of that noble race, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> coursing through me or whatever he said. It's uh, um, and it, it was basically just a a very very politely English middle finger to uh-huh. the Nazis. It was so stuff like that. But he came to that after it came to his attention that in the Hobbit, the way that he had described the dwarves, the way that he portrayed the dwarves, uh, was was um at least potentially it could be seen as pretty anti-semitic mm-hmm. um you know yeah I, I won't get into the whole thing but people can look it up you can just trust me i'm on sure this. there's plenty of angry youtube videos of people <laughs> grabbing onto that and running with it <laughs> right and so somebody brought this to his attention and he was mortified um and, oh my gosh you know gosh I, I certainly didn't mean anything like that so you know yeah so he's somebody who uh, saw things like that and he learned and he grew and, and all that so all that to just say that um that I think he did pretty well with this sort of thing, but that isn't to say that he wasn't still a man of his time. Yeah. And he's writing this alternate history of kind of Northwestern Europe, mm-hmm. you know, everything from the British Isles to France and Germany and, and the, the Nordic lands and all that. Um, and, and that's what it was. And so you can excuse a lot of stuff. Like I, it doesn't really bother me that in his story, the, uh, the Haradrim or the, the uh, Easterlings are, you know, they're uncouth and they're evil and the blah, blah, blah. Because it, to me, that just feels like, well, yeah, if you're, that is what people kind of would have thought mm-hmm. in those times, you know, in, uh, in, uh, you know, pre middle age Europe. Yeah. They, you know, they don't, those people are just kind of rumor to them. And, you know, yeah. anyway, so, so I excuse a lot of that, but sometimes you come across a line like this. The blood of the Numenorians became became much mingled with that of other men, and their power and wisdom was diminished. And every once in a while, you come across that, and it just kind of, ugh, yeah, just hurts a little. I mean, you got to take you got to take the Numenorians and you mm, take them out of the picture as the demigods a little bit, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, probably other ways could have done that. Yeah. Other than saying you know, they intermarried with lesser people. And I mean, you know me, I'm, I'm hardly the most sensitive person in the world to this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so I guess, uh, Hey, if it, uh, if it bothered me, I'm sure it bothered a lot of other people <laughs> is, uh, I guess my point there. All right, Ryan, I feel like we're coming up on the end of our, our time here. Do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up? And I mean, wrap up our Silmarillion Do I coverage. get to sail off into the, 
West now. <laughs> That's correct. Yes. For, for your service <laughs> on this this podcast series. Absolutely. Um, so is this open to is just this section or any Silmarillion um, final thoughts? If, if you're going to go with the whole Silmarillion, I'll give you kind of my last thought on this section first. Okay. Because you know what? I feel like I haven't talked enough in this episode. I know. It's really, if you look at the waveform, there's there's not enough of you going on here. <sighs> Somebody's going to tally it up. <laughs> it's going to be like, um, you know, when you're, you're halfway through uh, or three quarters of the way through a football game and they show time of possession on mm. the screen and you're like, oh no, oh no. Yes, but then they got to break down that stat even more and <laughs> meaningful <laughs> sentences that actually were complete from me are even further down the line there. So, yeah. like. Poor possession. Anyway, <laughs> that's right. You gotta, you gotta elbow me out of the way, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. My last thought on this section is uh, an inconsistency between this and the Akala Beth chapter that we just read, and why I love that inconsistency so much, and things like this, because you come across this uh, several times if you're really paying attention. If you start to get to know the Silmarillion really well, you can find inconsistencies like this. So here's this one. Um, This is kind of uh, toward the beginning of the chapter. uh, We're recounting some of what happened in Akala Beth. Uh, Let's see. Sauron went to Numenor as a hostage. There he abode um, until he compassed their ruin. But that ruin was more terrible than Sauron had foreseen, for he had forgotten the might of the lords of the West in their anger. The world was broken and the land was swallowed up, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So why is this an inconsistency? Because it wasn't the Lords of the West in their anger. They were scared uh, (laughs) garbageless, so to speak. They were terrified. They had to go to Eru and say, uh, can you do us a solid on this and end this threat? And he does. He he remakes the world. And it's Eru who has to do all of that. But here in this chapter, we get um, he had forgotten the might of the Lords of the West in their anger. And I love this kind of inconsistency because it makes it feel even more like a collection of legends than like a, a very simple, straightforward narrative of here is what happened. There's a lot that's left up to interpretation. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, if you keep a line like that in mind and go back and reread the Silmarillion, stuff like that pops up. And I feel like it makes it more um how do i put this it makes it feel more real which is to say it makes it feel less real Mm -hmm. but it makes it more feel more like a real mythological cycle right Right. it doesn't have the clean consistency of you know news (laughs) right sort of (laughs) 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 um yeah no i get exactly what you're saying it actually kind of connects to my overall feeling about Silmarillion and, and viewpoint there is um, the idea that I, I this whole thing there's no there's no when, when the Silmarillion ends there's no they lived happily ever after there's no like beyond this point that you look into really yeah um, it actually leaves it and I at first I was like well I kind of want to know what happens to Middle Earth next? Well, if you think about it in the line of mythology or this, we are living in the in next, the next, yeah. yeah. Um, which is a cool feeling to come out of a story and and feel like I'm in the next of this, because mm. especially so much of this, so many of the books we have nowadays, they're placed after us. So you know, a lot of it's dystopian futures yeah. or it's something that's happened so far in the future. And we then cycle back through and realize, oh, this is us. This is, we've done this. We've, you know, there's the Charlton Heston, you down, you know, <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> oh, you, blew, you blew it all, you ruined it. Then we have that moment type thing. Um, it's, it's good and enjoyable to be on the other side of that and be like, there's this whole history here that we get to be the future of. Yeah. So. Very nice. Was that the final thought you were going to? That was my final thought for wow. the Silmarillion. Piece. Man, very nice. Um, there's a, there's this idea that predates the films, but those who have seen the Lord of the Rings movies, uh, may recognize it when the orcs cross, 
uh, the river in Osgiliath and um, they overrun all the people there. And there's that, uh, uh, they, they made up a character, Gothmog. He's this uh, kind of orcish commander mm-hmm. of the forces and he like, got the Spits lumpy the face. And, and, yeah, exactly, yeah. that guy. Um, he he stabs the commander in Osgiliath and then he says that the time of men is over. The time of the orc has begun. Right. And of course that turned out not to be true, mm-hmm. but there's this idea uh, that goes back 30 plus years in, in uh, Tolkien scholarship that his idea was that, yeah, the, the world was split into these kind of ages. And the first age was the age of the dominion of the elves. And at the end of the first age, they began to diminish all through the second and third ages. The, th- the second age was the age of the Numenorians. And then they began to diminish, you know, and, and well, and you can argue about that. It, you know, was it still the age of the elves? I don't know, whatever. Uh, but the dominion of earth passed to human beings. And uh, and so, like you say, at the end of the Lord of the Rings, okay, so the, the story, i.e. the world, kept going into the age of men. But then you think about what Tolkien saw in his lifetime, you know, mechanized warfare and pollution and, uh, you know, kind of the industrial revolution really, really kicking into high gear Mm -hmm. uh, from his childhood onward. And you must, uh, you kind of think, gosh, according to him, we're not in the age of men anymore. We're in the age of the orc. Mm -hmm. Um, See that? You know, the the, the imagery that we get from the orcs, whether it's in uh, Mordor or Isengard, with their machinery and yeah. what you know, what they would call magic, but it just being technology and and uh, pollution and filth and all that stuff. Like he, so he may have thought, "All right, well, I guess we're in the age of the orc now, or we're we are diminishing into the age of the orc." Would be right. another way of. I think that might be to me that reads a little more true than we are the orcs. Well, no, no yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it's um, the way he might have put it is, uh, you know, we all have. We all have some elf in us and we all have some orc in us. And what are you going to let prevail? The higher form of being or the lower, right? There are uh, two wolves in each man. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. You did it. You sent us <laughs> off with the joke, Ryan. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think we're going to get any better than that. So... Uh, take your two wolves and uh, <laughs> go to thelegendarium.com and uh, there you can find all of the, the, the stuff, the links. Please go to Discord. Um, let Ryan know what a great line that was. Uh, go to Discord. Go to the episode discussion channel and uh, at him, bro. Just <laughs> at Ryan, bro. Um, but you can also find the link to Patreon there uh, if you've enjoyed this series. I, ho- I hope you have. It's <laughs> Um, I, I'm talking to the listeners, but yeah, I hope you have too, Ryan. Yes, contractually, <laughs> I'm obligated to sit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. I, I hope people have enjoyed this. The purpose. I hopefully I made this clear up front, but the purpose of this uh, read along series was not to turn anybody into Tolkien scholars. This was to have some fun mm-hmm. with a difficult book, and I think we did that. Yeah. I, you and I and Kyle for most of the episodes, uh, we succeeded in that. Uh, I, I hope people have enjoyed it. Um, if you did, please uh, consider chipping in on Patreon. That would be absolutely fantastic. Otherwise, uh, yeah, go to thelegendarium.com for all the other links and uh, subscribe on YouTube. We'd love to see you there as well. Ryan, we'll see you for our next episodes, whatever they are. But until then, have a good one. Yeah.